Hello everyone, this is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. I'm doing something a little different with this video. I uh, recently published an article where I talked about the P-E ratio, the value of, of a P-E ratio as a good valuation reference. And in the article, in the comment section on the website Seeking Alpha, there was quite a debate raised about drivers of rates of return. And there was a lot of discussion about dividends and what contribution dividends make to total returns. And of course, there are advocates of dividends and there are also advocates of growth stocks. So what I want to do with this video is something a little different. I'm going to go through about 10 examples here just to try to make a case. And there's nothing special about any of these companies. I'm not necessarily recommending any of them either. I just want to really try to focus on what and from where rates of return are generated by or where they come from when investing in a common stock. Now, as far as total return goes, there are two sources of total return. Capital appreciation, which is simply the price move moving from point A to point B. Of course, keep in mind that can also be capital depreciation. And then the second would be dividend income, if any. But the notion out there has been studies done that said the rate of return, yet you know, this 90% of the market's return has come from dividends. And then people take these studies and they start making general statements about the market, about the importance of dividends. So I'm going to look at how important those things really are. And I'm going to start with a growth stock here, Alphabet or Google, as we all know it. And um, the key is I've got earnings per share up here. And I want you to notice that Google's earnings, the slope of this orange line, this orange line is a P.E. equal to growth rate, or it's a P.E. ratio of 34.4. Now, this is much higher than that 15 P.E. ratio I talked about for the average company, but this is obviously far from an average company. It's a significantly above average company and has had above average results. Now, if I put monthly closing stock prices on the graph, you can see that there are periods where it was highly valued. You can see there are periods where Google was undervalued relative to this earnings growth, and it's currently just moderately undervalued based on its long-term historical growth. It may be a little overvalued based on future growth. But here's the point. Not a dime's worth of dividends have been paid on this stock. However, if you invested $10,000 in Google on August 31st, 2004, which is where this graph started from, that $10,000 would be worth $235,936 as of yesterday's close. That's almost 10 times more money than an equal amount of money invested in the S&P 500. And the point I'm making here, there's not $1 worth of dividends. But what I really want you to see here, what I really want you to focus on, it's the growth of Alphabet's earnings or Google's earnings that generated the capital appreciation in this case or the long-term significantly above average return on this particular stock. Now, a second example is Amazon. A lot of people are really confused about, you know, Amazon. Now, if I drew this chart using operating earnings, which I'll go ahead and do for you, you'll see that the company really has not made much in the way of profitability, and yet their stock price has gone straight up. So if I take that normal PE line, you can see that their price is way above what their theoretical earnings would justify. But EBITDA is actually a form of earnings or even a form of cash flow. It's earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And if you look at their EBITDA growth, going back here to 2003, you can see that they've grown EBITDA by about 36.3% a year. And the normal price to EBITDA over this time has been about 40 or consistent with the company's EBITDA growth. If you look at their performance, $10,000 would have grown to a million forty-three thousand over this time frame versus 10,000 growing to 33,000 in the market. Now there again, no dividends here, but a significant amount of growth. And I'm measuring performance here rather than using our earnings, because Amazon's a little different, I'm using EBITDA. But I could also utilize operating cash flow. The point is, it's the growth of the business you invest in, whether you want to measure that with cash flows or revenues or earnings. Because also, if I look at price to sales, you can also see, and I'll, I'll take off the price, or you can also see that Amazon's sales went from $5.2 billion you know, to over 170, almost $178 billion by the end of 2017. So this is clearly a growth story. But once again, it's all about capital appreciation. Now with my next example, I'm going to look at a dividend aristocrat, Air Products and Chemical, because this is your more normal company. So I want to familiarize you with the graph. You've got earnings per share, and you can see there has been a relationship, but the blue line is the normal value or the average valuation that the market has applied. And all this tells us is that the market really prices this A-rated company, dividend aristocrat, with 24% debt. 
at a very high valuation. But nonetheless, this 7.8% in growth is going to generate a capital appreciation slightly better than that because the stock is overvalued now. So we had that 7 plus percent growth translate into 9.2% capital gain. But let's put this into perspective. And you invested $10,000, it would have grown to 39,817 not reinvesting dividends. So $29,817 was capital gain, $8,224 was dividend income. So you so I'm just going to use an approximation here about a third of your return came from the dividend, not 90% of your return or not 50% of your return or in the case of Amazon and Google, not zero return came from dividend. Here you got about a third of your return from dividends, but you also had a company that's increased its dividends year after year at an average rate of around 10% per annum. Now, I can also reinvest the dividends, okay? And people sometimes get confused there. But keep in mind, if I'm reinvesting the dividends, now the $10,000 grows to $57,000, and my total dividend income was $10,000. But I've reinvested money every quarter in this example. So it's not a one-time investment of $10,000, because you always have the choice. You could spend the dividends that the company pays, or in this you know, example I'm using here, you could reinvest the dividends. But the point is, it's not that dividends aren't important. In this particular company, they're very important to your rate of return, but they're not the primary driver, as I like to say, they contribute to total rate of return. Now, this is an exception here. Let's look at Avon, because once again, you see the clear evidence that earnings drive market price or earnings drive capital appreciation. In this case, we're talking about earnings driving capital loss. A $10,000 investment in Avon made on December of 2002 would only be worth $790. That's a 15, almost we'll call it a 15% annualized compounded loss per annum. But the company did pay some dividends back then. So you got $2,966 in dividends. So in this case, significantly, the majority of what returned there was, and there really wasn't any, have come from the dividends when the company was paying their dividends. And the point I'm getting at is it's all about the individual stock that you're looking at. You can't make general statements that dividends generate most of the return, or for the growth devotees, capital gain makes all the return. Now, this is a business development company, BlackRock Capital. I thought this was an interesting example also. I'm going to take the dividend payout ratio here. I want you to notice the company's earnings growth has been minus 2.2%. And I want you to notice that the stock price tracked that almost perfectly at about just under nine times earnings. Okay, that's been a normal valuation multiple for this stock. But from a performance point of view, $10,000 would have shrunk to $4,027. However, this company did pay a high amount of dividends, you know, 7,780 versus 2,300 had you invested in the S&P. So you ended up with a positive rate of return. But in this case, literally all of the return came as a result of the dividend income and the capital appreciation component was actually capital depreciation. You actually lost money owning this stock because again, earnings drive the capital appreciation as well as the dividend income. Now, my next example is, is a high yield example. I'm going to switch to operating cash flow here because this is a master limited partnership, oil and gas storage. And I want you to notice based on cash flow, this company pays a very large portion of its cash flows out. It's you know currently yielding 5.9%, but historically, a $10,000 invested in 2002, which is just the time frame I'm measuring here, would have generated just over 19,000 in dividends. Your 10,000 would have grown to 29,000. So you made about you know $19,000 in capital gain and about $19,000 in dividends. And here you have a clear case where half of your return came from dividends. Now, once again, if you reinvested those dividends, which I'll simply calculate end of quarter reinvestment of dividends, your rate of return would have been significantly higher at almost 14% compared to the S&P at 10, and instead of you know, 6,000 in cumulative dividends, you'd have received almost $35,000 in dividends had you reinvested your dividends with this particular you know, partnership. But if you look at it from a straight investment, I prefer looking at it without reinvesting the dividends, by the way, as an aside, 
because here you're seeing the real impact of dividends. How much did you get from dividends? How much did you get from profit? And what did you end up making? So dividends are an important aspect for certain companies, but they're also not important for other companies. Now here's a company, Harmonic, and I'm going to draw this as a long-term graph, and I've got operating cash flows here. I can switch to operating earnings because it really tells the same story. You can see that this company, I chose this example because you had a case where there was a lot of market hype for, you know, back in the irrational tech bubble, irrational exuberant period in 2000. We had this huge collapse, but then we had the stock price going nowhere. And so if you look at this overvaluation period, or if I shorten the time frame a little bit and shorten it down to a 19-year time frame, I want you to notice with this particular example, you would have actually lost money. You got no dividend income. Your 10,000 since December 31st of 2001 would have shrunk to 4,500. But now watch this on the flip side, because this is also another aspect of this is valuation. So if I take this stock and look at it when it's more reasonably valued, then you're going to get a better rate of return, even though you still had almost no earnings growth here. So now you end up getting a rate of return, a positive rate of return, because as I also mentioned valuation as well as where the earnings go are going to be the determinant of how much money you make and is also going to be the source of dividend. Now MicroStrategy is another company that I'm going to look at from a similar fashion. If I look at it from a long-term perspective, you can see that same story as we just looked at. You have negative rates of return, etc. However, if I shorten the time frame, and this is really a better example, what I was trying to get across in the previous example, here you had this 15 PE ratio roughly where you could have bought it right, you know, actually at a 14 PE ratio. And even though earnings didn't do anything, that you paid a, an attractive enough valuation, you ended up with a very nice rate of return, almost 15% a year, and actually did better than the market. But even though the company's operating earnings did very poorly, but again, 100% of your return would have been from capital gain. There was no dividend income in this particular example at all. Now, the next one I'm going to go to is realty income, and I'm going to switch to funds from operations here, which is the appropriate metric for this. Now, this is an income stock, okay? Its primary allure is income. It has about 5% growth. I'll go ahead and extend this to the maximum length of the graph. It has about 5% FFO growth. You can see that it's paid out a very high portion of their funds from operations, or you, know, you could also say funds available for distribution with a REIT, which they're required to do. So when I look at performance here, a $10,000 investment made in December 31st, 1999 would have thrown off almost $31,000 in dividend income versus $3,600 in the S&P. However, you also got some nice capital appreciation. Your $10,000 would have grown to $55,000. So here, you had about $45,000 in capital appreciation above your $10,000. You picked up another $30,000 in dividends. You end up making 12% a year. But here, the dividend becomes a very important component of your total rate of return. So it's not about whether dividends in the general sense are you know, a great determinant of return. It's how dividends relate to the type of company you're investing in with a REIT like realty income, you know, obviously the dividends become a very important component. And then last but not least, we're going to take a look at Southern Company, which is a utility stock. And I'm going to go to operating earnings here. Cash flows are all about is the dividend cover. And as you just saw, it clearly was. But here we have very little growth. I'm going to shorten the time frame just so I can pick a time when the valuation was attractive at the beginning, right at a 15 PE. And it's just slightly less than that here. I want you to notice this. The earnings growth was 3.5%. So the slope of this orange line is flat. It's actually only 3.5%. In other words, this line is actually increasing at a rate of 3.5%, or that's the growth of the company. The capital appreciation component, $10,000 would have grown to $17,000. That's 3.3%. That's virtually identical, you know, just slightly less because of the valuation anomalies I mentioned to what the company grew. So again, it's the results of the business, the growth of the business that generated the rate of return. You have the market price in the short run going high and low, you know, always reverting back to this 15 PE ratio. But in this example, dividend income is critically important 
important. If you invested $10,000, it would have grown to $17,000 in capital gain. That's a $7,000 profit, but you would have got $11,000 in dividend income. So the majority of your 6.5% total annualized rate of return in the case of a low growth, high yield stock or moderately high yield stock like Southern Company comes from dividends. So it's not dividends that drive returns. It's dividends are not a driver. They're definitely a contributor when the company pays it. But ultimately, what makes you money is buying stocks at sound valuations and then owning companies according to what your growth expectations, your objectives. If you're looking for you know, good, solid, steady income, a quality utility like Southern Company might make sense or a realty income if you can buy it at an attractive evaluation makes sense. If you're looking for growth, a stock like Amazon or Google might more foot the bill. But anyway, the idea here is what determines rate of return. I'm going to argue its value and growth. Those are the things that ultimately drive return, including dividend income, if any. It's been Chuck Carnival saying thanks for listening. If you liked what you saw here, interested in learning more about Fast Graphs, email us at the email address on this page or call us at the number. It's been Chuck Carnival again saying thanks for watching.